in which our happy couples learn that life is not easy, whether as newlyweds or as recent divorcees. Chapter 8 Anna, during this first period of her liberation and quick recovery, felt herself unpardonably happy and filled with the joy of life. The memory of her husband's unhappiness did not poison her happiness. This memory was, on the one hand, too terrible to think of. On the other hand, her husband's unhappiness had given her too great a happiness to be repentant. The memory of all that had happened to her after her illness the reconciliation with her husband, the breakup, the news of Vronsky's wound, his appearance, the preparation for the divorce, the departure from her husband's house, the leave-taking from her son, all this seemed to her a feverish dream from which she had awakened abroad, alone with Vronsky. The memory of the evil done to her husband called up in her feeling akin to revulsion, and similar to that experienced by a drowning man who has torn away another man clinging to him. That man drowned. Of course it was bad, but it was the only salvation, and it was better not to remember those dreadful details. One soothing reflection about her behavior had occurred to her then, in the first moment of the breakup, and now when she remembered all that had happened, she remembered that one reflection. It was inevitable that I would be this man's unhappiness, she thought. But I don't want to take advantage of that unhappiness. I, too, suffer and will suffer. I'm not deprived of all that I once valued most, my good name and my son. I did a bad thing, and therefore I do not want happiness. I do not want a divorce and will suffer for my disgrace and my separation from my son. But however sincerely Anna wanted to suffer, she did not suffer. There was no disgrace. With the tact they both had so much of, they managed, by avoiding Russian ladies abroad, never to put themselves into a false position, and everywhere met people who pretended that they fully understood their mutual position far better than they themselves did. Even the separation from her son, whom she loved, did not torment her at first. The little girl, his child, was so sweet, and Anna had become so attached to her, once this little girl was all that she had left, that she rarely remembered her son. The need to live, increased by her recovery, was so strong, and the conditions of life were so new and pleasant, that Anna felt herself unpardonably happy. The more she knew of Vronsky, the more she loved him. She loved him for himself and for his love of her. To possess him fully was a constant joy for her. His nearness was always pleasing to her. All the traits of his character, which she was coming to know more and more, were inexpressibly dear to her. His appearance, changed by civilian clothes, was as attractive to her as a young girl in love. In everything he said, thought, and did, she saw something especially noble and lofty. Her admiration for him often frightened her. She sought and failed to find anything not beautiful in him. She did not dare show him her awareness of her own nullity before him. It seemed to her that if he knew it, he would stop loving her sooner and she feared nothing so much now 
though she had no reason for it, as losing his love. But she could not help being grateful to him for his attitude towards her, and showing him how much she appreciated it. He, who, in her opinion, had such a clear vocation for statesmanship, in which he ought to have played a prominent role, had sacrificed his ambition for her, and never showed the slightest regret. He was more lovingly respectful of her than ever, and the thought that she must never be made to feel her awkward position did not leave him for a moment. He, manly as he was, not only never contradicted her, but had no will of his own, and seemed to be concerned only with anticipating her wishes. And she could not help appreciating it, though the very strain of his attentiveness towards her, the atmosphere of solicitude he surrounded her with, was sometimes burdensome to her. Vronsky, meanwhile, despite the full realization of what he had desired for so long, was not fully happy. He soon felt that the realization of his desire had given only a grain of the mountain of happiness he had expected. It showed him the eternal error people make in imagining that happiness is the realization of desires. At first, after he had united with her and put on civilian clothes, he felt all the enchantment of freedom in general, which he had not known before, and of the freedom of love. And he was content, but not for long. He soon felt a rise in his soul, a desire for desires, an anguish. Independently of his will, he began to grasp at every fleeting caprice, taking it for a desire and a goal. Sixteen hours of the day had to be occupied by something, since they lived abroad in complete freedom, outside the sphere of conventional social life that had occupied their time in Petersburg. Of the pleasures of bachelor life that had diverted him during his previous trips abroad, he could not even think, because one attempt of that sort, a late supper with acquaintances, had produced in Anna a dejection both unexpected and exaggerated. Contacts with local or Russian society, given the uncertainty of their position, were also impossible. Looking at places of interest, not to mention that they had already seen everything, did not have for him a Russian and an intelligent man, the inexplicable importance that Englishmen are able to ascribe to it. And as a hungry animal seizes upon every object it comes across, hoping to find food in it, so Vronsky quite unconsciously sees now upon politics, now upon new books, now upon painting. Since he had had an ability for painting from an early age, and not knowing how to spend his money had begun to collect engravings, he now chose painting, began studying it, and put it into that idle store of desires which called for satisfaction. He had an ability to understand art, and to imitate it faithfully, tastefully, and thought he had precisely what was needed for an artist. After some hesitation over what kind of paintings he would choose, religious, historical, genre, or realistic, he started to paint. He understood all kinds, and could be inspired by one or another, but he could not imagine that one could be utterly ignorant of all the kinds of painting, and be inspired directly by what was in one's soul unconcerned, whether what one painted belonged to any particular kind. Since he did not know that, and was inspired not directly by life, but indirectly by life, already embodied in art, he became inspired very quickly and easily, and arrived as quickly and easily at making what he painted look very much like the kind of art he wanted to imitate. He liked the graceful and showy French manner more than any other, and in this manner he began painting a portrait of Anna in Italian costume, and to him, and to everyone who saw it, this portrait seemed very successful.
If you enjoy this format, please leave a like and subscribe and return tomorrow for the next chapter.